The following is a CNN special report. These gates mark the site of one of history's greatest horrors. We are in the biggest cemetery of the world here. During the Holocaust, more than one million Jews were murdered here at Auschwitz. All my aunts and my uncles, everybody is dead now. Part of Hitler's plan to wipe out the Jewish people. We saw my mother. She went straight to the gas chambers. Liberated 70 years ago, only a fraction of the prisoners survived. I was crawling on the barrack floor because I couldn't walk. Beaten, but not broken. The real story is what I accomplished here. These are the stories that must never be forgotten. These are the voices of Auschwitz. village that's not even on the map. It had a hundred families. I was the firstborn, so I was very special there. I had two sisters, we were three girls, and it was a very happy childhood. We had a beautiful home. My father had a very good business. He had a men's tailoring and textile business. Culture was written in very big letters in my family. The classics, German classics, were read to us on Sundays. Everybody had to learn an instrument. We were the typical German-Jewish family. We were upper-middle-class Jews. As a child, I never experienced any uh, anti-Semitism. We had a wonderful childhood. It was all very gradual. You see, I never knew that uh, it was a problem to be Jewish. I must have been eight years old. Uh, I was wiping the blackboard and somebody said, don't give the Jew the sponge. I said, what the hell is going on here? Because we were concerned, my father bought a battery-operated radio. And I remember hearing Hitler's voice. He was always yelling. I would ask my parents, who is Hitler? And why is he yelling? And why is he saying that he will kill all the Jews? And both of my parents said, don't worry, Hitler won't come here, the Nazis won't come here. If it had been less gradual, perhaps my father would have been more conscious that one has to get out of here. It was 1944, mid-March. It was Passover. Two gendarmes came on horses and said, pack food and clothing. They surrounded the house. They gave us one hour. All the villagers lined the street. Not one single one of them, not even my best friend, said they were sorry. Every Jew was on the street. We had to walk 14 kilometers to the train station. We were loaded onto the cattle cars. Nobody spoke. There was silence through the whole journey. They didn't give us any food or any water. There was no bathrooms, nothing. There was a, a bucket, an empty bucket in the corner. 
A hundred people were packed in our cattle car. They didn't open up for the air or nothing. Oh, it would doze off and it would become more like a nightmare that you were fading in and out of it. We didn't realize that the journey is going to last three days. We were actually traveling all over, picking up Jews. The end of the third day, the train stopped. I heard latches. The doors opened. The crowd was pushing as they were coming out of the cattle car. They were pushing. I was standing there trying to figure out what is this place. The kitchen door opens and the Führerin walks in. Everybody jumps up. Achtung! Rumors are in the camp that I was going to be shot. For days, Renee Firestone was packed in a cattle car like this one with 120 other people. When the doors were unlocked and opened, she was here at Auschwitz. Renee and her sister were told to go to the right, their mother to the left, and straight to the gas chamber. We had a beautiful public swimming pool. And this was taken only a few months before we were deported. They always played music. And they played the song, It's Now or Never. And even today, when I hear that song, how we didn't know that it's now or never, The first thing we heard was the loudspeakers that were telling us to leave our suitcases at the railroad station. My sister was telling me, wait for mother and dad. And that's when I looked around and I realized that I will never find them. It was impossible. When they were loading the trucks, we saw my mother. She went straight to the gas chambers. About three days later, when a group of men were marching, I recognized my father. I saw him in the striped uniform with the shaved head. And I was trying to hide from him. I didn't want him to see us, my sister and I, knowing what it would do to him to see us, the way we be looked, also with the shaved heads in a rag. But as he walked, our eyes locked. I saw him crying, and I was crying. And at that point, we knew that something terrible has happened to us. That was really the first time that I realized that this is a hopeless situation. I was worried about my sister because she was skinny and tall and uh, so young, especially when we were separated. And every morning through the wires, could see each other and say to each other, I'm still here, don't worry, I'm still here. And then she didn't come the second day and the third day, and then I knew that she must have been taken away. 
every day I thought, it will end soon. Don't worry, it will end soon. I went into the kitchen and the head kitchen maid was a girl from my hometown. She knew that I was studying to be a designer. She says to me, Renee, we don't need you peel potatoes. I'll give you some paper and pencil and why don't you draw some pictures for us of gowns that we will be wearing if we survive and we'll go to a New Year's Eve party. I sat and I was drawing. Everybody was looking, coming over, uh, and talking about it, and having a little fun, really. We did notice that the Commando Führerin is on her way to the kitchen. And the kitchen door opens, and the Führerin walks in. Everybody jumps up, Achtung, and these pictures are flying all over the kitchen. She bends down, picks up one of these pictures, looks at it and yells, who made this? And I said, I did. She says, follow me. Rumors are in the camp that I was going to be shot. She takes me to her apartment. In the closet is a sewing machine. She picks one of the pictures and she says to me, can you make this? I never made a garment in my life, but of course, Yavor, of course I can make it. Am I gonna say I can't? A few days later, the camp is liberated and I didn't have to finish the garment, fortunately. The Russian soldier rides in and he tells us that the war is over. This officer jumps off that horse, comes around the women, starts hugging them, kissing them, and, and cries. Then he stands up in the middle of these women and he beats his chest and he yells to us, Yato Zhegyubrei, I'm also a Jew. And we all start crying. Yes, that was our liberation. That was probably the worst time of my life wondering, did any of my parents survive? Did my sister survive, or even my brother? Where is he? Where am I going? We were roaming around Europe, hitchhiking, and uh, in Budapest, we found out that there is a school where survivors come and sign in so that those who are looking for somebody may find somebody uh, in those lists. And I was there a whole day, found nobody. And on the way out, there was a swinging door, and I pushed on the door to leave, and somebody was pushing from the other side, so I stepped back, and the door opened, and my brother was there. We settled in Prague and we started an industry. <laughs> My brother was an artist. We bought some silk parachutes and we made those circular skirts. My brother painted on them and we were selling them and we made a lot of money. We arrived to America. Life started all over again. I was a successful fashion designer here. I'm still here 70 years later. I am in awe and in shock and in amazement that I'm still here. I really never thought of revenge. There is no other revenge. Auschwitz, 
I wake up with it, I go to bed with it. My name is Renee Firestone, and I am an Auschwitz survivor. The story that shapes me as a person is my father. He said, if we don't survive, you honor us by living. Nice, right? It's good. The words above the gate here at Auschwitz say, Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. Martin Greenfield was sent to work as a tailor. When he ripped a guard's shirt, it could have finished him. Instead, it saved his life. We were the last transport. I was 14 years old. That's when my life stopped being what it was. My name is Martin Greenfield, and I survived Auschwitz, and I'm happy about it. <laughs> You see the gates to get into the camp. You see the guys who come to help get us off, their prisoners, in those stripes. And they were not talking to us. I was still a kid, you know. They showered us, and they gave us the stripes. They gave us some kind of a shoe, no socks, no underwear, nothing. father and I got tattooed together and then my father sat down with me and he said you're strong I'm strong we both gonna survive you got discipline you learn things we taught you how to survive how to live when I got to Auschwitz they put me in the tailor shop I wanted to build cars. I was a grease monkey. I didn't know anything about tailoring. I was a kid. The tailor I could speak to, he spoke Jewish. And I said to him, what should I do here? He says, well, you could wash the shirt for the Gestapo. He said, take a brush and take soap and rub it till it's clean. I was so dirty that I kept on rubbing it till it ripped up. He says, then it's a little problem, he says, because tomorrow he's coming for the shirt. So I said, but what can I do? I'm going to show him it's ripped. He wasn't too happy about it. Who ripped the shirt? He said, me ripped the shirt. So he gave me a little beating, but he threw the shirt at me. So then I asked the tailor, can you show me how to fix the collar so I could have a shirt? Nobody has a shirt. He says, I'll fix you a shirt. So I put it on. Guess what? I ripped another shirt. I got beaten up for another shirt. I had two shirts. And those shirts I used to shower in. I used to wear them. And nobody ever stopped me. So I was not that much when the Russians were coming. So 10,000 people started. 500 of us survived. That was one of them. I don't know if it was of the shirt. It made me feel warmer because I had something below. And it taught me something, how important it is to, to be dressed right. It had a big influence on me. I came here with borrowed $10 in my pocket. I started here for $35 a week. 
but I wanted to learn everything perfectly. All my teachers who taught me here, tailors and everybody, I always wanted to be better than them. We make very special handmade clothing. The people that I dress, the presidents, going back to Eisenhower, the Mayor Bloomberg who retired, Clinton. When they try on my suit that we measure here, nice, right? they don't recognize themselves. When I came to work here, I had to do it the right way, everything. That's why I became what I am. All my aunts and my uncles, everybody is dead now, but I never went to any funerals of my family. Because when you don't see them, you never believe that they die. They never touched anybody, they only helped other people. Why would they die? It's inconceivable. That is my biggest problem. But it's not a problem for me because I will never forget them. The story that shapes me as a person is my father. Because before we were separated, he said, if we don't survive, you honor us by living. So my past is sad, but my future is great. I have a new family. I have four grandchildren. My two sons work with me, I'm happy. How could you not be happy when you have your sons working with you? And I hope I could work for the next till a hundred because I have the energy and if God keeps me here that time and my head works and I'll be here. Last time you saw your mother was right here on this platform. All I remember is seeing her arms stretched out as she was pulled away. Here at Block 10 at Auschwitz, Dr. Josef Mengele ordered hideous experiments on twins. Eva Kor was one of the few who would live to see Liberation Day. We heard a lot of Germans yelling all this outside and then the cattle car doors slid open. Thousands of people poured out. The biggest confusion that I have, can ever remember, yelling, screaming, dogs barking, people looking for one another. When you heard them screaming in German, raus, raus, schnell, schnell, you thought what? I was only 10 years old and I looked around trying to figure out what on earth is this place? My mother grabbed my twin sister and me as we stood here on this selection platform 70 years ago. We were holding on to mother, a Nazi was yelling in German, Zwillinge, which means twins. He noticed Miriam and I because we were dressed alike and we looked very much alike and he demanded to know from my mother if we are twins. And my mother asked, is that good? And the Nazi nodded yes, and my mother said yes. That moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother to the right of me. We were pulled to the left. All I remember is seeing her arms stretched out as she was pulled away.
Our processing began late in the afternoon, and I decided to give them as much trouble as a 10-year-old could. Four people restrained me, two Nazis and two women prisoners. They heated the needle over the flame of a lamp. When it got hot, they dipped it into ink. My number never came out clear because I was not a very cooperating victim. I beat the Nazi holding my arm. It was my home. For most of the time, I was in Birkenau, which is almost nine months. Uh, the barrack was filthy, and about two, three hundred children. And Miriam and I were given a bunk bed on the bottom. One of the biggest problems we had was the rats. They were good Nazi rats. We would be awakened in the morning at 5 a.m. with the shrieking sound of a whistle. Mangala would come in to count us every morning. He wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had. We used to be brought here three times a week. There were benches or we would stand. In about a hundred kids at a time. Poor eight hours naked and they would measure just about every part of my body compare it to my twin sister and then compare it to chart measuring comparing measuring comparing and they drew a lot of your blood at least two vials and sometime more from my left arm and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm how we didn't fail, I don't know. I tried to hide the fact that I was ill because the rumor in the camp was that anyone taken to the hospital never came back. They measured my fever and I knew I was in trouble. I was immediately taken to the hospital. It was filled with people who looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Dr. Mengele and four other doctors came, and then he began laughing sarcastically and saying, too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. For the next two weeks, I remember only one memory. I was crawling on the barrack floor because I couldn't walk. I would fade in and out of consciousness. And even in a semi-conscious state of mind, I kept telling myself, I must survive. I must survive. It was late in the afternoon of January 27, 1945. It was a Saturday afternoon and somebody had a watch because I clearly remember saying it was 4.30. A woman ran into the barrack and began yelling at the top of her voice, we are free, we are free. They were smiling from ear to ear. And the most important thing for me was that they didn't look like the Nazis. The most dramatic part of it is the children marching between the two rows of barbed wires. They gave us chocolate and hugs. And this was my first taste of freedom. How Miriam and I ended up on the front, I do not know. I do remember it being filled, but I did not remember that we were in the front. It is so iconic. I recognize myself. And now 70 years later, you're here. I am here and I can tell the story. I discovered that I survivor of Auschwitz and Mengele's experiment. I had the power to forgive. I am not possessed by anger and fear. 
I can rise above it. And to me, that is the ultimate victory. My name is Eva Moses Kor. I am a survivor of Auschwitz. We were the sort of showpiece, you know. I mean, if anybody came to visit the camp, they didn't show the gas chambers. They'd show us, we were the showpiece. My mother was a violinist. There was always music in the house. My elder sister played the piano, my other sister played the violin. I've got pictures of me pretending to play the cello on a children's broom and a comb, and I was singing to myself. Cello has become a sort of <laughs> the, the red line through the life. My name is Anita Lasker Walfisch. I am a survivor of Auschwitz. We arrived there at night. And uh, we waited all night uh, in, a, in a block. And the next morning came the situation which, in a way, saved my life. Because uh, various prisoners do the tattooing and the shaving of hair, etc. And the girl who was um, doing me, she asked me what I was doing before the war. And I said, I, I used to play the cello, you know. It seems a completely ridiculous thing to say in Auschwitz. I played the cello. Fantastic, she said. You'll be saved. I was naked without hair. I had a toothbrush in my hand. That was already a great privilege. She must have slipped me a toothbrush. You know, a toothbrush was fantastic. And then Alma Jose came. And I didn't understand anything because she was quite well dressed. And we had a conversation about cello playing. So where did you study? I mean, you cannot imagine a more unbelievable situation. She said, well, fantastic, because we haven't got a cello in the orchestra. You know, the orchestra was just being uh, created. And everybody who could play anything, you know, a little bit of mandolin, uh, scratching on the violin, it was a very peculiar collection of, there were about five people who could play their instruments. The rest were all people who were trying to be saved into this so-called temporary survival possibility. She said to me, look, you'll have to go to quarantine, but we'll fetch you to the music block and then you play, you know. So now I was in this quarantine block, I mean, for God's sake, that was really terrible. I mean, not many people got out of there. Then they fetched me, I said, where's the cellist, you know? No, I haven't played the cello for two years or something. I said, well, excuse me, I must just see whether I can still move my fingers. Look, I wasn't particularly frightened not to pass the audition. I was, I was a savior. They didn't have a low notes in the orchestra. Every camp had some sort of band, you know. But we were the only one, really, that consisted of, complete, of children, more or less. And then there was Alma. She was very, very strict. We were almost more afraid of her than of the SS. But she somehow managed to, I think, let us be more afraid of what we were doing than looking out of the window and seeing the smoke. It was a sort of complete escape mechanism. I can't remember what we sounded like, but some people say we weren't too bad. Marsch Militär by Schubert. I can hear it now. <laughs> 
We were the sort of showpiece, you know. I mean, if anybody came to visit the camp, they didn't show the gas chambers. They'd show us. We were the showpiece. You'd think, oh, this was not so bad here. There were people who thought it was wonderful to just shut your eyes and forget where you are. And there are people who find it very offensive. Music here, this, we are in the biggest cemetery of the world here, without graves, you know. My whole life seems to consist of the most unbelievable coincidence. Like with the shoes that I had when I was still a normal person. I had a pair of pigskin shoes which were sort of light leather. We dyed them black, put red laces in and put very big pom-poms at the end of the laces. And I had these shoes in Auschwitz. And then comes the situation where the girl who tattoos me asked me what I did before the war. And when she saw my shoes, that girl who tattooed me, she said, look, you lose your shoes anyway, give them to me, I can, I can use them. And when my sister arrived, by sheer coincidence, it's the same girl and the shoes were still there. She said, I know these shoes. Well, yeah, they belong to a girl. She's in the orchestra now. Well, that's my sister. The girl who did this came running to my block and said, come quick, your sister is here. That's how we met again. And then suddenly one day we were put on a train and sent to Belsen. We didn't think that we would survive because, you know, Belsen was completely different from Auschwitz, you know. But there was nothing in Belsen. You just waited to die. That's all. But the feeling to actually go away from Auschwitz was fantastic. We're going away from here. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't really, we didn't care where we are going as long as we are going away from this unspeakable hell. The war in Europe has ended. The hour for which the world has been six years waiting has come. It was an unbelievable moment, the, the liberation. When we saw the first British uniform, <laughs> oh my God, there are soldiers who don't want to kill us. Well, we just couldn't believe it, really. We thought maybe we are dreaming. No, 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 actually, British uniforms we see. Then came the terrible realization, what are we doing now? Where do we belong? Do I go back to Breslau? Nobody there that I know, my parents are dead. I came to England and of course my only idea was to catch up with eight years that I've lost and you know, become a musician. And I was lucky, I uh, met a lot of very good musicians and we soon eventually we got a date with the BBC and eventually, you know, got more and more international and um, then became the English Chamber Orchestra. This was where I belonged somehow. I never really accepted that anybody has the right to murder me because I happen to be Jewish. Forgive, no, it's not for me to forgive. How can I forgive somebody who... How can I forgive? It's not for me. But I can go on. Survival was complete luck. It was very lucky to live. When I walked down the rail line to where the crematoria were, I just felt the ghosts. I just felt the ghosts. Auschwitz, it haunts us to this very day. 
It was one of the most efficient killing machines that anyone has ever experienced throughout history. Walking these grounds changed Steven Spielberg's life forever, as it did mine. I walked under that sign, Arbeit macht frei. frei. Work, Work will make you free. free. Yeah. And then when I went to Birkenau and saw the crematoria, the gas chambers, it was a powerful, powerful moment. The second time I went to Auschwitz with my wife, a rabbi took us and we said a prayer. And he asked me to come over near where the remains of the crematoria uh, laid. And he said, if you could put your hand in this sort of like mud hole. And I did, it was very soggy, it had been raining. And I put my hand in there and I brought my hand out and there was white sort of bone meal all over my hands because the remains of everyone over those years of mass murder rained back down onto the earth, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're still there. And that's something I'll take to my grave. Despite all of your brilliant films, you've said this is really your calling. I think it is. I didn't know it was my calling until um, Schindler's List came into my life. I invited some of the survivors whose stories we were telling to come to Poland at our expense and uh, watch us shoot the scenes where they were being represented by actors. How did you survive? By miracle. By miracle? Yeah. One of the survivors came over to me and said, I have a very, very big story to tell you. And all I'm asking from you is, do you have a tape recorder you can turn on so you can remember my words? So my words can be somewhere in perpetuity. And when she said that to me, it suddenly occurred to me that this was something more than a movie, that the movie was going to be a foot in the door to open up these testimonies and disseminate them all over the world, encouraging very courageous survivors to tell us their stories. In the middle of each cattle car was a bucket. I remember running out to the fence where we were locked in. She was wounded, so they killed her right on the spot. Death was all around in Belgium. It has a special meaning to you, not only as a filmmaker, but as a person, but also as a Jew. Yes, this was my renewal as a Jew, this entire experience of directing Schindler's List and then founding the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation in 1994. Never, never under pain of death. We have 53,500 heroes in our visual history archive. We hear from four Auschwitz survivors. Mm -hmm. Anita was a cellist, a young girl. Mm -hmm. Martin was a tailor. Rene was also a designer in the making. Eva, she was a 10-year-old little girl when she was brought to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Why did they survive whereas others died? It, just to say luck, that's not enough. It's not luck. It's more than that. These survivors somehow hung on tenaciously to life. Whatever didn't cause their death, disease, hypothermia, murder, somehow this group of kids made it out and were able to lead very, very productive and almost inspired lives. Unfortunately, the number of survivors out there is dwindling it's quickly. Dwindling, which is why this, this commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz 70 years later is so important. There aren't going to be enough survivors for the 75th commemoration. This is the last significant commemoration of the worst atrocity in, I believe, human history. But their stories will live on. My name is Eva Moses Kor. My name is Martin Greenfield. My name is Anita Laska Walfish. My name is Renee Firestone. I really believe that everybody who's given their testimony, they become teachers in perpetuity. I am a survivor. I am a survivor. And I survived Auschwitz. 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 And I'm happy to be here with you. My name is Inga Auerbacher, 
and I'm a child survivor of the Holocaust. I went into terrorism at age seven. I wanted to hold on to something from home. I mean, they took away everything when we arrived in the camp. The most important thing was to keep something from home when things were still good. And that was my doll. She meant everything to me. Seeing the doll for the first time was a wow moment because it's real life, it's there. I can see what she's been through. My name is Daniel Lyle and I was inspired by Inga's story. Inga's doll made the history of the Holocaust something I could relate to. Very, very important to have these artifacts to give proof to the world and for centuries to come, it happened. Your gift of $18 a month can help the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum continue to share the history of the Holocaust through artifacts like Inga's doll. We lived in this tiny room with a family from Berlin. They had a daughter whose name was Ruth. Ruth had the same doll, and her mother made some little clothing for her for her birthday, and she gave me some of those clothes that she couldn't take. She didn't make it. She was not even 10 years old when she was killed. The lessons of the Holocaust are still very relevant today. The more people learn about the Holocaust, the more we can help make sure nothing like this ever happens again. Donate now and receive this limited edition keepsake. I would like to think that the doll represents all those dolls that were taken with those children. Your gift of $18 a month can help us preserve the priceless belongings of Holocaust victims and survivors so we can continue to teach this important history and its lessons to the world.